Hi, friends, and thanks for listening to the Fashionista Life brought to you by True Fashionistas. I am your host, Jennifer Johnson. And at True Fashionistas, did you know you can shop, sell, and look fabulous? Today, we welcome into the studio Dr. Karen Gill. Hello. Hello. It's great to have you back in studio. That's awesome to be back. I'm going to let listeners know exactly what you do. So Dr. Gill is with Naples Aesthetic Institute, and she's a board-certified plastic and reconstructive surgeon with a specialty fellowship training in aesthetic surgery of the face, breast, and body. I got it right this time. (laughs) She is one of the only female plastic surgeons in Naples. She has garnered the respect of her patients, colleagues, and community, and her professional integrity, compassionate care, precise surgical techniques, and creative innovation, along with her passion for style, artistry, and beauty, has quickly elevated her into one of Naples' premier plastic surgeons. Thank you. That is just amazing. It's, I, it's been an awesome ride, for sure. I think it's so great. One of the only females here. And like we, if you guys had listened to the first podcast that we did, we talked about your journey and how you got here, and yes. you were originally interested in architecture and and design and all that. And this is where it has led you. Yes. And it's, it has been an awesome experience. And I think, you know, not everyone loves what they do for their job, Mm -hmm. but I love it. That's so so great. It's been wonderful. And you're an architect of, you know, the face and the body. Yes. For sure. You know, that's creating what people are asking me to create within Mm -hmm. reason, of course, (laughs) within reason. And we'll talk about that. Yes, We definitely will. So We're going to talk about some questions that we've received from some listeners, and maybe you have some that we can fill in with as well that, you know, maybe our listeners haven't asked. So the first one is around tummy tucks. Got it. Okay. So everyone wants that, you know, flat stomach and when's a good time to have one. And the one thing that I heard over and over and over again, kind of surrounds, you know, can I gain that weight back? And it also goes into the second question, which was about liposuction. Right. So if I have a tummy tuck with liposuction, can I gain that weight back there or is it just going to go somewhere else? Got it. So the first question is when's a good time to have it? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I definitely think after children. So, um, you know, some women gain and lose weight prior to having kids, but I think the most common time is after children mm-hmm. because sometimes that skin doesn't bounce back. And so patients who request tummy tucks um, you know, they have lost the weight after pregnancy. They're trying to work out, but for some reason that skin of the lower abdomen doesn't get, it's not improved. Mm-hmm. And so tummy tuck is the best procedure for that because in addition to removing the skin, you tighten the muscles that separate during pregnancy. Oh, so sometimes we forget wow. about that part, right? It's not just the skin, but as oh your, gosh. as your belly grows, your muscles separate. So So tightening those muscles, getting rid of the extra skin can get you to a flatter abdomen. And as you mentioned, sometimes we include liposuction Mm -hmm. if someone needs it. So you actually go in and it's not, it's at that point, it's not just cosmetic then you're repairing the muscles. So yes, I mean, partially it's cosmetic, but I do have a lot of patients that have benefits from tightening those muscles. So you know how your trainer always says, Mm -hmm. if your abs are strong, your back won't hurt. Right. So even in my personal experience, my back pain went away when I, when I did it. And that wasn't the reason I had a tummy tuck, but my lower back pain from not having that stability of the core Mm -hmm. after children really improved. So that was a nice surprise for me that I can share with my patients, you know, that says, Hey, if your muscles aren't tight and we can tighten them, that may be an added benefit Mm -hmm. from having the tummy tuck. Wow. Yeah. So if they do it with liposuction, yes. Okay. Which goes into my next question. Will I gain weight back there? Now, you know, if providing I follow a sensible diet, meaning I'm not going to, you know, how does that look? So can I gain it back? (laughs) Yes. So the question is yes. Um, When we are born, we have a certain number of fat cells. And as we grow through puberty, those fat, the number of fat cells increase. Mm -hmm. At some point during puberty or during adolescence, those fat cells, you're not creating more, but as you gain and lose weight, those fat cells get bigger and smaller. So now fast forward to after having children Mm -hmm. or in a male who's having a tummy tuck, if I take away fat cells and then someone in a certain area, let's say the abdomen or the, or the sides, the love Mm -hmm. handles, and then someone gains 20 pounds, you're going to probably gain it somewhere else if you don't have fat cells left in the abdomen to gain it. So if before a tummy tuck, that is the place that you gained weight and then you gain 25 pounds afterwards, it may go to your arms, it may go to your legs because I've taken away the fat cells that are in the abdomen or in that love handle area. 
So my goal is always to get you to your um, goal weight or mm-hmm. your reasonable weight, right? And don't crash diet, but where right. where is reasonable for you? And if it's a healthy weight, then we do it. And we say maintain that weight. Mm-hmm. So this is a w- weird question that I just thought of. It wasn't from one of our listeners, but so you have liposuction. Sure. Okay. And you're like, uh, how many areas can you do liposuction in someone at a time? Like, okay, I need it in my stomach and I need it in my butt and I need it in my thighs. Right. So safety is always first. Mm -hmm. Um, So actually in Florida, we have certain limits on how much fat you can take out. Um, I think that personally, I'm a little bit conservative with that. So it's not about the number of areas, but how much fat you're actually taking out. Okay. You could easily do two, three, four areas as long as you're not taking out liters and liters of fat, because if you do that, it can be dangerous, right? Oh, wow. How much fluid we're putting in, the fluid shifts that occur. So in general, as I mentioned in the first pod, pod, podcast that mm-hmm. we discussed that this is not a weight loss surgery, mm-hmm. it's kind of tailoring troublesome areas. Um, so if someone needs that much liposuction, I would say, you know what, let's get on a good diet, exercise regimen, trouble right. areas we'll take care of. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. So breast augmentation. Yes. I, that's got to be like one of the number one surgeries. The that most are done. common. Yes. So let's talk about that. Silicone, saline, you know, there's a lot of talk about health issues. Sure. Let's talk. So let's lay it all out. Yeah. There. <laughs> so, you know, silicone um, implants were really invented in the 60s and uh, we've gotten better and better implants. I think in the in the early times, people were worried about implant rupture and implant mm-hmm. exposure with the silicone. Right. right. Um, and that's still a concern for patients. What I would say to that is that our societies are trying really hard to ensure that there are no health risks with it. There are mm-hmm. some entities out there that are that feel that silicone may cause symptoms, constitutional symptoms, which means like hair loss, Mm -hmm. um, fatigue, et cetera. And as we work through those, we haven't yet seen that uh, there is a scientific link. Does that mean it's not there? No. So when I have a patient that comes in, I counsel them about, you know, that there is a subset of women that don't feel good with Mm -hmm. silicone implants. And if you choose to, saline is a great option. And we actually have another option called the ideal implant, which is a saline implant but feels a little bit better than a regular saline implant. So it has more of the feel of a silicone. So making sure the patient has the information to Mm -hmm. sort of decide for themselves. At the same time, I used to do a lot of breast reconstruction for breast cancer patients and I use silicone implants. I would put a silicone implant in myself. So Mm -hmm. I don't think that they're dangerous, but I do think counseling patients on, you know, some of the symptoms that some women are having is important so they can make an informed decision. Absolutely. Wonderful. You know, talking about silicone versus saline, yes. is there a pro or a con? So I think, honestly, the feel of the implant is the biggest thing. And if someone has a decent amount of breast tissue, you could get away with a saline implant, no problem. Um, but silicone is the most natural feeling. So that is, I think, why most patients cho- choose silicone. In my practice, I'm probably 90% silicone. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. Is your closet overflowing? Or maybe your kids' closets are as well. Or maybe you just want to redecorate your home. If you're wondering what to do with all that stuff that you've accumulated, bring it all to True Fashionistas or even ship it to them for free. And they'll sell your unwanted items for you. They take away all the hassle by doing all the work. And all you have to do is sit back and collect your money. You can reach them online at truefashionistas.com. Come into the store or check them out on Facebook or Instagram, and that's truefashionistas.com. All right, friends, we are back with Dr. Kieran Gill, and she is with Naples Aesthetic Institute, and we are dishing all about plastic surgery. All about it. All about it. All right, so let's talk about the face. We've talked about the body. Yes. Eyelids. Or what is the number one thing that you see done on a face? I mean, I've heard a lot of people as they get older, they do their eyelids. Yes. So I think... Um, eyelid surgery and facelift surgery are probably the most common. Um, I have an oculoplastic surgeon that works with me, Dr. Nadia Kazem. So she does wonderful work, uh, upper eyelid lifts, lower eyelid lifts mm-hmm. to really rejuvenate that eye area. Um, probably is the most common if you look nationally, um, with Botox and fillers, I think that's probably changed the landscape of facelift surgery. But as I mentioned in the last podcast, lower face and neck, mm-hmm. so the jowls and the neck, really, we don't have anything great for it. So um, both both procedures can look very natural. I think that is the one 
that part of the body that people are the most concerned with not looking natural because you can't hide that. Right. right? So, um, but it's a very, it's a very satisfying procedure for someone who is a good surgical candidate for it, especially if they have natural results. Got it. Yeah. So for facelifts, yes. let's say you're like, I'm assuming you would go, okay, you don't need facial plastic surgery, but we can do this, this, and this. Are there other things that can mimic the results of a facelift without getting a facelift, like little mini procedures? So there are. And I think um, the trick with that is that we have a lot of non-surgical injectables. We have a lot of different technologies. And I think to get the biggest result, you kind of have to stack those technologies Mm -hmm. together. So it's not either or. So Botox, fillers, skincare, and technology to get you as far as you can with the non-surgical. And not everyone wants surgery. So those those that say, hey, I'm never going to have surgery, then that is where that they they land in the spectrum of what we can do. So maybe doing all therapy treatment or radio frequency treatment of the lower face in addition to Botox and fillers can get them maybe 30 to 40% there. What are those two procedures you just talked about? So radio frequency. So all of the non-surgical skin tightening, there's a lot of different modalities. So all therapy is ultrasound based Mm -hmm. tightening. There's radio frequency, which is another collagen booster. There are lasers that can tighten. And all of those um, tightening techniques try to induce collagen, which is what Mm -hmm. we lose as we get older, right? Um, Obviously, it's not going to replace what I can do with the muscles of the neck, you know, the the sort of structural face of the structural portions of the face. But they can get you a really good result as long as you know that it's not going to do what surgery does. Like I said, a lot of people land there and I think it's very reasonable. How long does it take to recover from a facelift? As I'm sitting here thinking, yes. going, hmm. <laughs> so it's funny because everyone's, um, every patient's tolerance of when they want to go out is different. I've had patients that will put on sunglasses and be out with their sutures in at dinner versus oh. patients who like, I don't want to be seen until everything is, uh, you know, recovered. So Because you're pretty swollen. Yeah, you're swollen. So I would say two weeks of not planning anything social, mm-hmm. right? At two weeks, you can put makeup on, go out with your hair down, you know, cause the suture, the incision lines are a little bit red for the beginning mm-hmm. parts of, you know, post op recovery. But by two weeks, I think you should be able to go out and be social. Um, I wouldn't be crossfitting <laughs> at two <laughs> weeks, but going out, yes, mm-hmm. you could do that. But no workout, no workout. It's like crazy. four weeks. I used to okay. like to say. So what is your most asked for surgery? Re- most requested? It's a mix, but I would say, um, and this is probably with national trends is breast surgery. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, more women do breast surgery mostly because that it's the spectrum of age. So mm-hmm. from 20 to 80, right? So you see it younger. Yeah. So that's why it's the most common. Um, I think next would be body contouring. So it, what's interesting is it's not just after kids, but I have a lot of patients after menopause because a lot oh. of things happen after menopause. Oh, right? you're telling me. So it goes. <laughs> so it goes back to if you had a tummy tuck at 35 or 40, and then you go through menopause and you gain a whole bunch of weight. Hey, now I want arms, or you know, I want to have liposuction mm-hmm. of my arms or my thighs or my breasts have dropped or have gotten bigger. So I have a lot of patients who have had implants, you know, when they were younger, and then they go through menopause and their breasts get larger, and they say, "Take them out." let's do a lift. I don't want these anymore. They're too big for me. So it's, it's interesting. It's interesting what a woman goes through in their Mm -hmm. life and their priorities change a little bit. You mentioned, uh, lipo or, or, you know, arms. Sure. Can you really, like I, you know, like when I do the pageant (laughs) way. Or like when my, my son grabs my arm and (laughs) you did that to me, my friend. Thank you. I, I mean, it's, I remember, you know, even 10 years ago. Yes. Working out. Yes. I did my tries and it was just perfect. Right. It felt like the next day they were tighter. Yes. Now, different. it's like yes. I can't do enough yes. and they're still wobbly. Right. What, what can you do to fix that? So that is a difficult problem. I'm not going to oh. lie. So liposuction in any part of the body requires good skin quality, right? Mm-hmm. And skin quality is genetic and it has to do with age. So the, the skin of the back of the arm can lose collagen pretty quickly. So if someone has a bat wing or a flappy yeah. arm, right? <laughs> right? Like as we talk blast. about it, if it's good skin quality, you can liposuction that. Mm-hmm. That's no problem. If it's good, if it's moderate skin quality, you can combine that with skin tightening treatments after liposuction. If it's true laxity, like that skin is flabby and no matter what I do with liposuction, you're still going to have that. Then we're talking about an arm lift. 
which is oh, a really- you do arm lifts? Yes. Oh my god! And you know what? Arm lifts um, are very satisfying for the right patient who says, hey, I would rather have a scar on my arm and be able to fit my arm into a sleeve than mm-hmm. have this thing hanging off of my arm. So it's a it's another thing. It's hard to conceal that, right? Especially of in course. Florida, we're wearing tank tops. Mm-hmm. But our surgical techniques have gotten pretty good. Scar placement's pretty good. So unless mm-hmm. your arms are up in the air, you're not going <laughs> to see that scar. Wow. And some I didn't... women just own it. They say, yeah, I had an arm lift. So what? Right. <laughs> I feel better. That'd be me. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, can arms... we book next week? <laughs> but that's, that's like aging, right? Mm-hmm. Like even me going through the process of using to have really fit skinny arms. And now I'm like, mm. hey, what happened? <laughs> you know? But I can see, in my opinion, someone starting out, you know, I'm in my late four. God, did I just? We won't say anything. My late four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but- I can see doing that now when perhaps my skin is in better yes. condition, not crepey and all right, that. Right. So that, you know, 10 years, 20 years down the road, right. they're still hopefully like that. Yes. And mm-hmm. you know what else um, is important is all those non-surgical technologies. If you have maintenance with that, if you're mm-hmm. every year doing something to keep as much collagen in your skin, you're going to age better, right? So mm-hmm. radio frequency treatments of the arms, microneedling, things like that. You do something every year to boost that collagen. You're going to be better off in 10 years than someone who doesn't do that. Have you, have you ever, or, you know, I'm sure you have, but the, the collagen supplements, does that do anything for you for that? So I haven't personally taken it. Am I considering it? Yes. I have to do some research <laughs> on, on the it, table. but I do have patients that do take them and um, as long as you're taking one that's reputable, I don't think there's a harm with it. Sure. But I myself have not started it, mm-hmm. but maybe I should. <laughs> maybe <laughs> now I you got to. me thinking now over I here. Too. <laughs> yes. Well, you think about your hair is getting thinner, your nails don't grow right. as fast. You mm-hmm. know, like where skin loses some of that elasticity. Right. So maybe we all need to take I, it. <laughs> I'm, I'm considering it now. <laughs> um, mindset. Yes. We kind of chatted about this on the last podcast, but you know, somebody you see somebody coming in and you're just like, they shouldn't have surgery. Yes. I know we talked about you would be vocal about that and everything, but going into having a cosmetic procedure with an open mind and not thinking it's going to make you skinny. And and what do you say to your patients? So um, I think that's part of the interview process. They're interviewing me, but I'm also interviewing them. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important things is making sure and understanding that your patient has realistic expectations and setting those expectations. I think that's the most difficult part of my mm-hmm. job. It's not operating because right. I love to operate and I'm I'm technically skilled at it, but making sure that you understand expectations and the patient understands where we're going to end mm-hmm. up. I think that's the most difficult thing to navigate in plastic surgery. So there's really two types of patients that I say no to. One is that it goes back to you need diet and exercise before we do anything, mm-hmm. right? And then the other one is the one that comes in complaining of, for lack of a better word, a deformity that I don't see, mm-hmm. right? So those are two patients you're, I know that I can't satisfy um, and who don't need surgery yeah. because if I don't see a problem, what are we going to operate on, mm-hmm. right? Right, so, absolutely. So open mind, yes, but also realistic expectations. Love that. That's awesome. So if our guests, our listeners would like to get a hold of you, how do they do so? The best way, um, I think, is going to our website, www.kierangillmd.com, which has contact forms and our phone numbers. Um, You can submit something online or just call my office and speak to one of my awesome staff members to get in to see us. Fabulous. And we'll be sure that we drop that in the show notes as well. Perfect. Thank you again for thank being you for here having with us. Me. It's Absolutely. Been fun. And thank you friends for tuning in. This has been the Fashionista Life with Jennifer Johnson brought to you by True Fashionistas. Make your day fabulous. Yeah.